Joshua Horowitz has spent seven years researching and writing War of the Whales, a comprehensive account of the 20-year battle between ocean and whale conservationists in the U.S. Navy of its conduct of training exercises using high-intensity sonar in whale habitats. Mr. Horowitz is also the founder and publisher of Living Planet Books, which specializes in books by thought leaders in science, medicine, and psychology. And he lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife and three daughters. So please join me in welcoming Joshua Horowitz. Thank you for that. I want to thank Bob and, and Michael Lapides for making my appearance here possible. I, I grew up spending summers in, in Quisset outside Falmouth, and this was more than the Dairy Queen across the Bourne Bridge. This was my favorite stop, and I was always lobbying from the back seat that we turn off 95, 195 and come, come, come have a look. Uh, and it's, it was great this afternoon. I got to spend a little time walking around, and just every time I come here, I was here researching the book, uh, and the, the staff here has always been great, and the exhibits just continue to grow. It's very exciting to see the direction the museum is growing. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I think anyone who, who presumes to write a book about whales has to tip their hat to the maestro, so this is mine. It is not down on any map. True places never are. Uh, those of you who know Moby Dick know this is a reference to Queequeg's uh, South Pacific island home, but really I think uh, he was really, Melville was speaking more to the fact that any book that has to do with humans and whales always is a thin line between fact and fiction. I mean, in fact, Moby Dick was based on, on the story of the Essex. Um, but really, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I thought about this quote a lot because I, I did my best to do a really comprehensive history of, of this story, but the truth is more than the facts, and uh, that was sort of my job, is to talk to enough people, enough scientists, enough military people, enough lawyers to, to, to try to get to the truth of the story. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is not so much the book, because I don't want to spoil it for, I assume most of you haven't read it, uh, but I, I, I'd like to talk about sort of the through theme of the book, which is that uh, this is really a, a story about uh, two groups that care deeply about uh, the oceans and whales, but for very different reasons. And, and the through theme is that these people all were in some ways transformed by their uh, encounters with whales in unexpected ways. And as a writer, I mean, this book had it all for me. As a writer, it had, you know, submarines and espionage and, and whales and cool science and that bordered on science fiction. And, um, you know, my, my editor insisted the subtitle is a true story, and he said that's the only subtitle you need and, and should have because unless you put that on the book, people will think this is fiction because it's so fantastical. And, that's what tends to happen in the presence of whales and people interacting with whales. So I want to talk tonight just a little bit about our human relationship with whales, why they've mattered to us in different ways over time, and where we are today. And it's going to be kind of broad brush, but and 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 sort of end where the book begins, um, but also include some of the backstory that is in the book. Um, it could really be called a love story, too, because it really is about this passionate connection. And it's, it's as I said, a, a, a culture war between two factions. One is the Navy, and uh, this story stretches back to the Cold War, uh, the beginnings of the Cold War. And for, you know, a solid 40 years, from at least 1950 approximately to 1990, the Navy had a very fearsome enemy uh, in, the, in the form of the, the Soviet armada of submarines. And really, their, their prime directive was to track these very uh, frightening uh, and, and devastating weapons. And we had the same weapons, and, but you know, these were capable of, of launching uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles from thousands of miles off. And, uh, and what's unlikely about this story is, is the allies they recruited in this were small cetaceans, dolphins, orcas, belugas. Uh, pilot whales, and the reason is that I'll go into a little more detail. Is that the Navy are, are, are Navy scientists are the ones that really uh, connected the dots and confirmed the hypothesis that that whales, toothed whales, uh, have 
a very advanced form of biosonar, which they use to hunt, uh, to navigate, and to see their, see, see their dark ocean environment. On the other side of this culture war is a generation of Americans who were raised with a different orientation towards these animals, you know, which if you're my age, Flipper, the movie, the thing, Namu, the killer whale, uh, and then of course in oceanariums and aquariums, uh, and eventually in the wild, I mean, it was somewhat late to the game, but whale watching of course was the natural evolution of that. And um, as whaling waned, whale watching grew as a commercial enterprise in a way that people could connect to whales in their natural environment. And you know, the natural evolution of that is people wanted to become even closer to these animals and, and be in the water with them, whether they're dolphins or, you know, enormous whale sharks or um, much bigger animals. Uh, you know, so <laughs> this is an ongoing conversation, if you will, and, and, I, and, and, and it's really a question mark in terms of where we go from here, but, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind, I mean, this this museum is a wonderful chronicle of the age of whaling, the, the prior whale wars, if you will. Um, and, and now, so the question is, where do we stand with the survivors of that, and, and where do we go from here? I, just to talk about my own orientation, I was, um, I knew very little about whales, to be honest, when I started this book. I, uh, I knew what Mr. Biggs had taught me in ninth grade biology, which is that Whales were marine mammals that abandoned, I'm sorry, were, were land mammals that abandoned land for the, for the sea and were very successful there and became fully aquatic mammals over the course of, of millions of years. And that was about all I knew. Um, until I was 20 years, when I was 20, at a very impressionable age, I, I had my first encounter with Moby Dick and the great floodgates of the wonder world of whales swung open to me. And, but my takeaway from, you know, like most people, I skipped the cetology chapter on first reading. But, but, I, but I read the rest of it with, it was a very important book to me. I read it at an impressionable age, and it was such a powerful book. And what it really spoke to is this mythic relationship we have with these animals. And uh, it went well beyond whaling. It was really about what whales have come to represent to us, and, and, and they're very mixed uh, relationship, our very conflicted relationship with them over the years. So, um, flash forward 30 years, and I was uh, my first time I actually ever saw whales in the wild with my daughter, uh, one of my three daughters. I took on it to Baja California. I'm sorry, Baja Mexico. I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of visiting there. It's a, it's this unique environment. It's a whale lagoon where gray whales return every winter after. Uh, being uh, feeding in the Bering Sea, thousands and thousands of miles away, and they come here to give birth to their calves. And it's this, these are wild whales who actually approach people. I mean, you're only allowed out in a few people in small boats, and they actually invite this kind of contact. That's my daughter there with having her own encounter. But I can tell you, once you have this kind of experience, and certainly once you see your daughter having this experience in the presence of a, of a whale and her calf, it changes the way you think about whales forever. So it's got me thinking about digging deeper into our, the history of our relationship with whales. And if you go back to cave paintings, which we know to be where we, where you imagine to be where early humans recorded their most important encounters with the outside world, and you see that whales were there. And they were there as, as perhaps as deities, but also as prey from the earliest time. This is from a cave in what's now South Korea on the shore, and I think it's 7,000 years ago, and, and, and clearly these are men in canoes, or people in canoes hunting a whale. And uh, this is the DNA of our relationship with whales. Uh, and, and primitive people, if you will, ancient peoples throughout the world have, have hunted them, really since uh, the earliest days. And, but they've also revered them, built them into their uh, mythologies and into their religions, into their art. Uh, the Greeks famously had a dolphin fetish. I mean, the, uh, Apollo built the Delphic Oracle uh, to them. They were demigods to them, and they were always portrayed in a very benevolent light. Um, this, 
this is one of my favorites. This is a, a vase, an, an Etruscan vase painting that I think speaks to this idea of this connection between humans and, and, and whales or cetaceans where this is apparently a story of a, of a pirate who escapes by transforming himself into a dolphin. Um, the Hebrew uh, Judeo-Christian tradition had their own take on, on whales. Uh, the whale in the story of Jonah or the great fish, it could only have been a whale. I don't think there's a fish that could swallow a human and I, I learned today that only sperm whales probably are capable of swallowing uh, humans so perhaps it was Perhaps there was a sperm whale that swallowed Jonah. But in any case, in this myth, it was a, uh, the whales were seen as not, a, not gods, but as a messenger of God. And in this story, uh, gave Jonah the opportunity to be reborn and, and in service to God. But meanwhile, uh, cultures around the world were hunting whales and uh, with great ferocity and passion. And this is really the beginning of at least a millennium uh, of, of organized whaling, where whales were really not much more than a commodity. They were really reduced in during this era to, uh, you know, floating vats of oil. Uh, of course, they lit the, the lamps of London and other European capitals. It was an enormous industry around the world, particularly here in the New World. Uh, and by the end of the 19th century, we were already, as the exhibit hall we were in showed that we were already going to the Arctic. The reason we were in the Arctic looking for whales is we had fished them out of friendlier waters largely. So, um, but there were limits to what these whalers under sail could do. The largest whales, uh, the blues, the says, the fin whales were still too large, too fast uh, for ships under sail to overtake. Uh, and then in 1864, there was a Norwegian whaler named Sven, Fo Sven Foyne who, who had who patented two innovations that really, I think, were the death knell for whales. One of them was the exploding harpoon, which could stop the heart of a blue whale at 100 meters, which he demonstrated in his live demonstration here. Um, he also introduced the first steam-powered whaling ship, which could overtake these, these previously uncatchable whales. So the 20th century was really the age of industrial factory whaling, and it, and you know, in service to products, commodities like baleen and uh, other things that seemed important at the time. Uh, but this was a devastating time for whales. The 20s and the 30s were particularly bad. Uh, in the 1930s, I think there were 30,000 blue whales and 24,000 fin whales were harvested, uh, so that we could have you know oil and uh, various kinds of lubricants. I mean, there are all sorts of properties, you know, that, that appeal to uh, all sorts of commercial enterprises, including, of course, pet food, of which uh, uh, whale meat was, uh, was marketed. So by, by um, the end of, during World War II, as you may know, the whaling was pretty much suspended around the world because the shipping lanes weren't safe and they also recruited a lot of ships into military service. But at the end of that war, uh, when the whalers went back out into the ocean in 1945-46, they were sort of appalled to see that there were significantly fewer whales. And it's largely due to the fact that they had overfished them. Also, you know, world war is tough on, on all marine life. And uh, unfortunately, they were used for target practice by air forces. And there were countless depth charges and other explosives in the ocean. So, um, there was, that's when the International Whaling Commission was started in 1946, not to save the whales in the way we might think about it, but to try to restore the stocks of, of, uh, of whales for future whaling. Um, the only other people who cared about whales in, in, in 1946 was the U.S. Navy. And, and, uh, and the reason was they had a, a fearsome enemy, as I said, the, the Soviet Navy was cranking out submarines at a much faster pace than we were, and we were in this new arms race to create uh, essentially floating, submerged and then floating missile launchers, and, and pretty soon uh, we and they were launching uh, nuclear uh, armed intercontinental ballistic missiles from beneath the ocean. So you can imagine uh, that kind of challenge and, 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 and how daunting that was, 
and not to mention, of course, you know, uh, the threat they pose to surface ships. So the, the traditional technology that the Navy had used going back to World War I uh, is what's known as active sonar. And uh, this is a simple illustration of that. But uh, these are, uh, you know, you basically are bouncing sound off of objects and reading the echo and interpreting the location and the nature of, of, of the object there. You can see a couple of little whales lurking in the background there, which is sort of the problem. So the Navy was always looking to improve, of course, their sonar technology. And the way they found their way to whales was, was through bats, interestingly. Uh, in 1940, uh, at the very beginning of the war, there was a, a young biologist at Harvard, a, an undergraduate named Donald Griffin, who was fascinated with bats. And he took it upon himself to solve a 200-year-old uh, zoological puzzle known as the Spallanzani bat problem. Spallanzani had been a, a naturalist in the 18th century who had deduced by blinding and deafening bats that they did, in fact, they must, he, he concluded, be navigating using sound. But because bats transmit at ultrasonic frequencies that humans can't hear, he couldn't prove it. So it became this kind of curiosity of natural science. So um, in 1940, Harvard had developed transistors and, and electronics that could hear uh, uh, ultrasonic sound. So he was able to prove that, in fact, uh, bats uh, hunt in the air using uh, sound in much the same way that uh, radar uses radio waves. And so uh, the Navy immediately started funding his work. Uh, the Office of Naval Research, which was founded in 1946, reached out to Griffin. And he speculated that perhaps other mammals that navigate in the dark might use uh, biosonar also. And he specifically suggested that perhaps whales uh, might. So this is now late 40s, early 50s. and. Uh, the Navy sent some of its best researchers down to the first marine park in America, which was in St. Augustine, Florida. It was called Marine Land. And, you know, Americans were in the beginning of their love affair with marine mammals. And one of the things they noticed is that there was a lot of noise coming out of these tanks. And they were clearly saying something to someone. And based on Donald Griffin's hypothesis, they sent some, and again, these scientists were not whale scientists. There were no whale scientists. I mean, the International Whaling Commission was starting to study this, and there had been people who had observed whales. Certainly whalers knew a lot observationally, but nobody had ever really investigated the anatomy, the, the, the true biology of whales. So they sent their, their scientists down, and, and um, you know, notably, a lot of this science came out of Woods Hole. Uh, which is, of course, nearby here, and, and during the war was sort of transformed from a sleepy academic institution into a, a really robust, I don't want to call it a Navy lab, but their funding has been predominantly Navy for decades and continues to be. And, and, and the Navy um, sent uh, Cheville and his wife, uh, Barbara Lawrence, down to Marine Land. They brought back a, a, a dolphin and, and studied it. And anyway, they, they, they they figured out, they came up with elaborate ways to measure their biosonar. And what they discovered is that they, not only did they possess biosonar, uh, echolocation is what Griffin called it, but that they, it was so sophisticated compared to what they could do with their own technology they evolved over decades that they were envy, I, envy might be the wrong word, but they were certainly covetous of this, of this gift they had and they also knew from observing them in marine parks, that these were highly trainable animals. They were social, they were obviously intelligent. Um, and so this began a, a two-track uh, program, research program. Uh, one of them was secret and one was not initially. Um, one of them was to train them to do, in this case, uh, retrieve objects from the deep ocean floor, because they were also very good deep water divers. Um, and to uh, sweep from mines. They, were, they, they could tell, they, they, they figured out that dolphins and other small cetaceans, orcas and pilot whales and beluga whales, could detect the difference between a decoy mine and a live mine. 
which is very valuable if you have an enemy who's spreading all these decoys and a live mine here, there, and everywhere. So they, uh, they, they use them to sweep mines in Vietnam and to patrol harbors. Uh, and they continue to use them today in the Persian Gulf from about 1988 forward. Um, because try as they might, they, they spend a lot of time trying to reverse engineer this, their biosonar into essentially dolphin drones, what are called AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles, which were largely developed in Woods Hole. And um, they've used those in the Middle East, but they, they really only work in flat bottom environments and they really have none of the sophistication that these animals have. So, um, so, so backtracking a little bit to the beginnings of this, of this program, this research program, is sort of where my story really begins and it sort of takes a right turn, if you will. The book doesn't begin here, but the backstory that's relevant does. What's so interesting and this, the thing that uh, really kind of continues to fascinate me about the story is the scientists because again the Navy created marine mammal science as we know it and they they recruited people out of neuroscience this is John Lilly I don't know if any of you know who that is he was a an NIH uh, neuroscientist who became fascinated he he did his his seminal work doing cortical maps of macaque monkeys but macaque monkeys have tiny brains and then he he'd heard that there were these big brain, these dolphins who have the brains the same size as humans and essentially the same proportion to body weight as humans. And so he went down to uh, marine land and he uh, experimented. He killed a few on the way accidentally, but he, he, uh, he became fascinated with the idea of communicating with these animals. So he got the Navy, in addition to steering the Navy in the direction of uh, of training them for military missions, he, he, he got them to fund his communication research and he set up a lab uh, down in, in the Caribbean. And in those days, for instance, LSD was legal, still legal for research. And there were a lot of researchers actually doing uh, research on animals, on humans, using LSD in various either therapeutic or, or investigatory uh, settings. And, he went, he, he, this was a, a, a program where he actually wanted to rear a, a dolphin or, or have a cohabitation experiment with this woman, Margaret Howe, and her and Peter Dolphin. And they became very close and uh, sort of too close for scientific comfort. Now you can read the book for details. But he also, he started not only experimenting with LSD on the, on the dolphins to see if, if they could communicate better with us on, on, on LSD, but he was taking LSD with the dolphins <laughs> in the tank. And, you know, so the result was he was sort of ostracized eventually by both his colleagues who had revered him as a pioneer in his field, as well as his Navy sponsors who asked for their equipment back. And he, um, and he then declared that these animals were unfit for captive research and liberated his dolphins and retired to California where he interestingly really became one of the fathers of the new age Save the Whale movement. So he went from writing popular books about dolphins to writing books about dolphins as extraterrestrials who we need to reach out to and learn from. And, uh, and there were other scientists not far behind. This is uh, a, a scientist named Paul Spong who was not Navy funded but was very much of the same school and he was a researcher briefly at the Vancouver Aquarium which is the first aquarium to have captive orcas. Uh, this was back in the early 60s and after studying them in captivity he concluded after about six months that these animals are not we shouldn't be studying them in, in captivity because we're not learning anything really about their true behavior, but also these are intelligent social animals who deserve to be, to live in their, in their natural habitat and we should be studying them there. And he was fired for that statement. But he, he's the person who reached out to Greenpeace. And um, Paul Spong is I think the second from the left here. But Paul Spong convinced these young, uh, eco-warriors that who previously had been founded to protest uh, nuclear uh, weapons tests above ground. And he got them to expand their mission to take on the Russian whaling fleet in the Pacific. And he went along with them and he played flute music through hydrophones piped underground to warn the whales and to, you know, 
bring them over here and away from the whales. But really, Greenpeace, it's hard to underestimate their role. They were uh, media darlings because this guy, I don't know if you can't tell, this guy has a video camera and they videotaped all of their encounters. It's really the precursors to, if you've ever seen Whale Wars on, on the Discovery Channel, it's really very much the same show. And um, uh, they were featured on, Walter Cronkite featured them on the evening news uh, you know, filming the, the, the harpooning with exploding harpoons of whales, and that was really a turning point. That was in the early 70s. And, uh, you know, they became the driving force in the Save the Whale movement. Uh, probably the most important individual was Roger Payne, who was previously had been funded by the Navy to research whether owls echolocate when they hunt in the dark. In fact, they don't, but. Uh, he was the chief investigator of that phenomenon. And then he started getting interested in whales. He went down to Bermuda, and he actually um, met a, a, a Navy sonar operator who was not generally credited with this, but really the recordings of this famous LP that, that Roger Payne uh, convinced someone to publish, uh, to, to print, and became a, really a best-selling album in 1970 was, and this is some sounds of these whales, um, he, he, he got these from a sonar operator who had recorded them through a passive listening system down in the Bahamas. And he, um, he went back to his lab and he deconstructed the sounds and concluded that these were in fact constituted um, song because they, they had to do with different syntax. They changed depending on the season and the, and the year. And uh, it became a sort of phenomenon where people was started to think about whales in a different way again. It was really a throwback to an earlier era where they were invested with sort of as spiritual totems and icons. And it was really the beginning of this new age movement that John Lilly was part of and really took hold, not just on the West Coast, initially in the West Coast, but really around the world. And uh, <laughs> whales were seen as something, you know, as, as perhaps guides for us, for we humans in our confused state. And uh, they inspired a lot of art, including tattoo art. And, you know, so again, a throwback to a time when people would, would, would tattoo themselves with these kind of images. And uh, a generation <laughs> of whale conservationists was born. So this is sort of sets the stage for my book, which sort of in a linear way begins uh, with two, two men. One was, a, was a, an attorney at, is an attorney at Natural Resources Defense Council. He was running their Los Angeles office. And, um, and another man who he didn't know at the time, Ken Balcom, who was a, uh, a veteran whale scientist of about 40 years who had been studying orcas in the Northwest uh, in the summers since 1976 and beaked whales in the Bahamas uh, since 1990. And so around about the middle of, of, of the 1990s, Joel Reynolds uh, really stumbled upon uh, some documentation about a, a secret Navy, uh, classified Navy sonar program that was really a holdover from the, from the Cold War that had ended pretty much 89, 90. And the Soviet fleet was the first thing to be rusted out in, 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 in dock because the Russians couldn't afford uh, their Navy. But they had this leftover system, which is called low frequency active sonar, which was this, it was called a beyond the horizon detection system. So rather than just being able to detect submarines at 50 or 100, uh, I'm sorry, uh, at five or 10 miles, these, these were systems with low frequency sound that were designed to, a high intensity low frequency sound that was designed to flood whole ocean basins with, with enough sound to sort of light it up. I had to sort of create almost like a sonogram of the ocean. Um, and there were various uh, technical hurdles to this because you can put a lot of sound out into the ocean, but getting a coherent uh, signal back and, and, and processing that signal was very challenging. But the Navy, as you know, is this their habit, were reluctant to let go of this Cold War system. They, who knew what future uh, naval enemy might be lurking beyond the horizon. And uh, so they, were, they had been testing this system for about 10 years when, when Reynolds stumbled on it. And what he pointed out to the Navy was that, well, 
this, of course, is in violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, various legislation that was passed in the early 70s at the sort of peak of the, the beginnings of the Save the Whale movement that were designed to protect uh, endangered marine mammals and so that anyone who was creating a harassment or a danger to whales like loud noise in the ocean uh, had, to, had to apply for a permit and get a waiver and the Navy during the Cold War had never done this. So he was sort of trying to push them in that direction and meanwhile he was getting, uh, he was hanging out with scientists and he was kind of hearing reports, isolated reports of uh, mass strandings of whales, atypical mass strandings of whales in the presence of Navy sonar. And initially these were disconnected reports, but he was really a sort of a Paul Revere, given that he was a lay person, he was not a scientist, he was an attorney. But he started going around to marine mammal conferences and trying to convince uh, whale scientists to start looking more closely at this issue and, and, and connect these dots that he suspected existed between uh, various kinds of high intensity sonar and, and, and unexplained mass strandings of whales. Well, this is where the story gets interesting to me because these scientists are all funded by the Navy. I mean, when I say all, I mean literally 90% of, of marine, mammal, marine mammal scientists in this country have historically had Navy funding as their primary funding source for the simple reason that nobody else really cared enough about whales to fund that research. So, um, it put them in a difficult position because on one hand, these are all very committed scientists who care about whales. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, they were reluctant to uh, get drawn into an adversarial legal battle, understandably, and they were also reluctant to bite the hand that was feeding the research. What they wanted to do was this. They wanted to be up close studying these creatures and not in a courtroom testifying. And so, um, however, when they, began, uh, I mean, you know, these are, where is the one? I mean, this, this is Moby Dick there. I mean, this is the ferocious sperm whale, and you know, that's his mouth, and, and, and you know, the true nature of these animals was starting to emerge when you studied them in their own habitat in a non-hostile way, and, and, and scientists, you know, wanted to get closer and closer to them. So, um, I want to just play you the sound of, you know, you've heard a little bit of what humpbacks sound like. This is a recording that Ken Balcom made actually later. He happened to be on site for two different strandings and he recorded this up in, in uh, Harrow Strait, his research station, orca station up in the Northwest. But it'll just give you a sense of what the frequency sonar is. That, that ship in the upper left corner is the USS Shoot, which uh, is, a, is a destroyer equipped with, and I've toned this down, but it's this is what it sounds like above the water. <laughs> this is actually recorded above the water at close range. And uh, you can imagine what it sounded like to these animals. And there was, there was a boat of, of whale watchers in the foreground. Um, and and, and these, these researchers who initially said, well, if there were a connection between sonar and mass trainings, we would see it, um, started to look at, at when there were mass trainings, started to look at the horizon and not infrequently would see uh, Navy warships. And um, so, uh, but despite the fact that there were these strandings and there were rumors of a connection, a whale on the beach does not last very long in a pristine condition, it, it, particularly in the tropics. Within hours, it, the, the, the specimen value starts to deteriorate. So there was actually, there was a large stranding in Greece in 1996 that was studied, but again, the conclusion by the Navy-led study was that there was, the specimens were, were not in good enough condition to really draw conclusions. So it wasn't until uh, the, f the spring of 2000, which is where my book in a linear way begins, and this is uh, Abaco Island, in the Bahamas, and uh, it's paradise. And these are the shallows, but offshore a couple miles is, is the deepest underwater canyon in the world. It's called Great Bahama Canyon. It's about three times the size, the, the length and depth of the Grand Canyon, so you can imagine the size of this canyon. And uh, Ken Balcom had been studying these uh, beaked whales there for the last 10 years along with Darlene, I'm sorry, uh, Diane Claridge, who was his wife and research partner at the time. 
And they were really the only people other than a, a Canadian researcher up in Newfoundland who had studied beaked whales in the wild. And I don't know, how many people know what a beaked whale is? Is anyone? Okay, well you're a very informed crowd. Most people, including myself, really knew nothing about beaked whales before I did this. And the reason is that they spend almost all their time diving at, at great depth. They dive up to two miles deep for 90 minutes at a time. So they spend almost no time at all on the surface. Uh, they come up, you know, occasionally to breathe, do a few bounce dives and go back down. So um, Balcom and his wife and, and the volunteers from Earthwatch would typically go out in boats with cameras and they were doing photo identification and really tracking this community that had lived there for, it turns out, million, tens of millions of years had been resident in this canyon. And they had evolved over that time to hunt it at depth, um, mostly squid. But they had very specified, you know, very specialized adaptations to hunt in this environment. And then one day, when they went out, um, whales started showing up on the beach, literally outside his doorstep of his house, right on the beach there. And then up and down the coastline, and reports were coming in. And it turned out to be the largest mass stranding of beaked whales. Um, ever recorded, the, the largest multi-species. There were three different species of beaked whales. And by the way, there are, beaked whales comprise, uh, I think, uh, a fully a quarter of all whale species. There are approximately 85, Bob helped 90 now. Uh, the new species they're identifying are mostly beaked whales. So there are 90 species, I think there are 24 species of beaked whales, maybe 25. So they're, they're, they're not uncommon, but it's very uncommon for these animals to strand. So some species of whales, pilot whales famously, uh, strand not infrequently, but um, Ken Balcom had been studying uh, beaked whales for, for 40 years, and um, he had never seen a live whale up close, beaked whale up close. Um, uh, so when they started stranding alive, he was, it, was a, <laughs> it was a big moment for him, and uh, he, he did, they did their best to push these animals, they're not large whales, so they were able to, when the tide came back in, to push some out to sea. Uh, an unknown number, I mean, if you can imagine these whales leaving this canyon, which they typically never leave, they've been living there, they never leave these deep water canyons, and something was going on in the canyon that drove them to this destination. So even the ones that they were able to push off from the shore had poor prospects, but in any case, this is where the story, where I got hooked on the story and, and decided to write this book, is that Ken Balcom had a, in addition to having a 40-year career, he was in his 60s at the time of the stranding. In his 20s, he had been, uh, he'd worked for the Navy as a sonar uh, operator, both an operator and a director, and a, he worked undercover in Japan uh, with sonar operations. And so he's probably the one person in the world who would have had the presence of mind to know how to collect specimens, um, who to call at the Office of Naval Research, who happened to be a former classmate of his from graduate school, marine biology graduate school, Bob Gisner, who ran the Office of Naval Research um, uh, Marine Mammal Division, and they agreed the thing to do was to cut off the heads of, of, of the freshest specimens and get them in a deep freeze, and that's what he did. So he was able to drag these rather large heads into a deep freezer. It was a restaurant of a friend of his, gave him his walk-in freezer, and, and preserve an evidence trail. And without giving away too much, I mean, he was a, he's a fascinating character to me because he really epitomizes the moral conflict for these scientists. He was actually not a Navy-funded scientist. He was too much of a maverick. And I, for reasons you have to read the book to understand, um, he never really chased her. He was a self-funded kind of, he lived by his wits and a few donations from donors. And um, in any case, once he had not only collected these heads, but delivered them up to a, a Navy uh, researcher's lab at, at Harvard University, um, he became expendable to the Navy's investigation. And so he faced a really tough moment for him because he was very loyal to the Navy, had never talked to anyone, including his wife, about what he did in, during his Navy time because it was classified. And um, he had to decide whether to hope that the Navy would do the right thing and have a thorough and transparent uh, investigation or possibly sweep it under the, under the rug. And 
you know, what I've found is the Navy is very, very rigorous. When something goes wrong at sea, the Navy is uh, the first to be banging the cage to figure out exactly what happened, what went wrong, and to hold whoever was responsible accountable. I mean, it's a real meritocracy, and um, they don't want to make, they don't want to repeat mistakes. So, you know, the act, after action report after a bad incident at sea, and certainly a mass stranding qualifies as such, um, was, uh, you know, something they would act on, but, but Balcom, having served for two tours in the Navy, understood that they were not typically very eager to share the, the findings of their investigations. So the Navy initially denied that they had been in the Bahamas at all. I mean, so, so Balcom not only knew how to cut off a beaked whale's head, which is actually difficult to do, knew who to call the Navy, but also knew enough about marine acoustics to recognize an acoustic trauma when he saw it. If, you, if I went back to those photos, the actual kind of clotting of blood on the sides of the face and, and different symptoms or signs of these, on these whales was a telltale to him that this was likely an acoustic event. He didn't know what. It could be dynamite explosions. It could be uh, an earthquake. But uh, he suspected it might be Navy involved. And uh, he was determined to press the Navy. So he really, at, at great, He's a really, to me, moving character because he, you know, I think a lot of whistleblowers have a sort of starry-eyed view of what lays ahead, and he had no illusions about what would happen to him personally and professionally if he called out the Navy on this. But um, anyway, you'll have to read the book to, to see how he got there. But eventually, he was able to compel the Navy to, to investigate this stranding, and it was really a turning point in... Uh, the scientific trail, and and uh, Joel Reynolds and he teamed up, and this uh, case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and there are cases that are continuing today, um, in California and Hawaii over sonar and explosives tests uh, that the Navy has gotten permits from. I mean, one of the stories in this book is, you know, the problem when you have a small underfunder regulated and uh, regulator in this case, National Marine Fisheries, which is somehow charged with regulating the US Navy, which is difficult. Um, so, you know, the Navy, every time the Navy applies for permits, which they now do, I mean, you know, to be fair, the Navy has come a long way. It's night and day from where they were operating in total black ops, you know, not applying for any permits, not telling anyone what they were up to in the ocean, to today where they do environmental impact statements on all their U.S. coastal ranges and have made a lot of other accommodations to reduce the risks of strandings. But unfortunately, uh, they also do lots of training exercises overseas. And as recently as this past April, there was a mass stranding during a U.S. and Greek and Israeli joint Navy exercise in the Mediterranean and five beaked whales stranded on the shore um, in, in Crete and uh, that's under investigation but it has all the hallmarks of a sonar related stranding and uh, so you know this is an ongoing war if you will I mean uh, the Supreme Court case was certainly a, a key battle in that war but it's really a, an issue that's yet to be resolved and, and I guess I just want to mention that, you know, my book also, what I hope readers will take away is an appreciation not just of the issue of military sonar, which is serious, but, uh, you know, in much better, uh, much better place than it used to be. But I think there's, you know, there's much bigger problem of noise pollution in the ocean from a lot of human sources, including, you know, notably from international shipping, from uh, uh, seismic, uh, exploration of for oil and gas and oil and gas extraction, which is ubiquitous around the world. So the, the noise load in the ocean has doubled every 10 years. They've retrospectively estimated over the last several decades. And what this means for not just whales, but all marine life is that their wavelengths are clogged with what's been called acoustic smog or, you know, whatever you want to call it, noise pollution, for lack of a better word. And so there have been innovative, you know, attorneys like Joel Reynolds who have used anti-pollution laws to, to, to try to uh, clean up the ocean, but it's a much, frankly, it's a much tougher task to take on oil and gas and, and, uh, and also uh, shipping interests because they have deeper pockets and probably, frankly, better lawyers than the Navy or more lawyers. 
So um, I wanted to just end my talk, and I'm hoping you know, to respond to any questions you have. I'd love to you know, answer any questions you have. But I wanted to, to just end on this quote. Uh, this is by a, another neuroscientist. It's a, a Japanese, Agawa. In the world of mammals, there are two mountain peaks. One is Mount Homo sapien, the other Mount Cetacea. And, and I, I don't know, that statement in this photo really speaks to me where we are now. I think we really are just, it's a very exciting time for anybody who's interested in whales and the oceans because despite all of the terrible threats to the oceans from climate change and whatnot, we really are getting some insight. And again, it's almost all based on Navy funded research. That's so one of the ironies. I mean, every time the Navy lost a, a legal case, legal battle over sonar, they had to commit to do more specific funding about uh, ocean noise and whales respond, behavioral response to noise in the ocean. So we know more and more, not just about that, but we're starting to get an inkling of, 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 of their true nature as we see them more and more in their natural habitats. And um, it's still a very uh, magical horizon because we, we, what we know is dwarfed by what we don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that they are social, large-brained, uh, very communicative animals, certainly among themselves. And um, I think, if nothing else, they've been tremendously adaptive. Initially, they adapted to become top predators in marine environments around the world. And they've adapted or survived um, really a, a, a millennia at least of organized whaling and um, they have adapted to all sorts of conditions and I think as we struggle for our own survival uh, as you know the oceans if the oceans die and we go with them eventually or certainly life as we know it does and um, I think that perhaps you know, we can, we can learn something about adaptation from them, or certainly uh, we can enrich our own experience of this planet uh, the more we get to know them. So um, with that, I, you know, welcome any of your questions.